Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, good to see everybody once again. Fourth program this afternoon, and uh, we'll finish this one, and we're out of here on our way home. For those of you on television, of course, why... Uh, We'll either see you tomorrow morning or next week. Just depends. I hope our television audience realizes that uh, if you're watching a daily program, those are reruns and uh, they just keep coming up in succession. If you're on a weekend and you're watching us on Saturday or Sunday, those are current. In other words, the programs that are playing on weekend lately were probably just taped last taping or within the last few weeks because a lot of people will call and say, well now, why did I see one program and you're way up in Hebrews and I see another program and you're back in Acts or wherever we are? Well, that's the reason. If you're on a daily program, you out in television, you're seeing reruns. If you catch a weekend, you're current. This is where we're taping today in the book of Hebrews. And again, we like to uh, thank our television audience for your support, your prayers, your giving, everything that makes it possible for us to stay on the air. All right, Hebrews chapter 6, we'll just carry on and we'll pick up now in verse 9. You remember in our last program, we were at verse 7 and 8, how that the things that promote production, the controlling, the weeds, and the things that will hold a crop down, the believer is in much the same set of circumstances. It's a constant battle to keep out the things that would affect our testimony. And then we had that verse 8, which is not very pretty. Nobody likes briars and thorns and thistles, and they are good for nothing but to be cast to the fire. And then verse 9, we get yet another B-U-T, another flip side back. But, Paul says to these people, you're not in that thorn and thistle category, but... Beloved, that's the secret. He wouldn't call them beloved if they weren't believers. And so he does. He says, but beloved, we are persuaded. Now that word persuaded is probably a little stronger than our English. And he was convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt. He said, we are persuaded better things of you. Well, better than what? Better than thorns and thistles, see? We're considered better things of you and things that accompany sell. Now, I put the word on the board just before we started, because that's the key word now. What is the number one theme of all of Scripture? Salvation. That's the whole reason for the Word of God, is to bring lost mankind to a knowledge of salvation. Because after all, three score and ten is the allotted time, 70 years, and if we go beyond that, that's just by God's good grace. So let's just even stretch it. Let's just say we could live 90 years. That's a long time. But compared to eternity, what is 90 years? It's not even a blink of the eyelash. And isn't it amazing that mankind can't get it through their head that 90 years is nothing to be compared with eternity? And to have 90 years of the good things in this life and push God out and then lose it all for eternity? I can't comprehend it. I just can't comprehend it. But yet, that's the way it's always been. The vast majority have spurned God. They've spurned His salvation. But, now Paul is admonishing these people that he understands that they do have salvation. All right, and the things that accompany it. Now it comes right back to what I've said so often. Salvation is not just a fire escape. Salvation is not just a matter of escaping eternal doom. Salvation is that which precipitates a life of spiritual production here on earth. That's what we're here for. Now, that doesn't mean you all have to be preachers or evangelists or missionaries, but it simply means that God expects every believer to be fruitful. Now, a verse comes to mind. Let's go back and pick this whole thing up of salvation. Let's go back to Romans. <clears throat> 
chapter 1, verse 16. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Now here's where I have one of my controversies with some of these new translations. They have taken out the word salvation, which is probably the most critical word in all of Scripture. And they've put something else in it. But here in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, verse that I think most of you know, you've heard it over and over, where Paul writes, Romans 1, 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it, the gospel, is the power of God unto what? Salvation. Salvation. Eternal life. The hope of glory to come. But that which makes it possible for us to live a godly life in the here and now. All right, so the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. All right, now let's just skip over to chapter 3. We're just going to use some verses that are associated with this one crucial word, salvation. Romans chapter 3. Let's just drop down to verse 23, which I always call the very first step of faith to salvation. And that is we have to recognize that we're sinners, that we have fallen short of the glory of God. Verse 23, for all, Jew and Gentile, black and white, rich and poor, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're sons of Adam we have inherited a sin nature. Now verse 24, being justified. Now what's justification? It's a result of salvation. <clears throat> when we enter into God's great salvation, He justifies us, see? So being justified freely by His grace, not from works, but by His grace, through another great word that is a result of salvation, what is it? Redemption. Redemption. Now, it's been a long time since we taught Romans. Maybe we should stop a second. What is the whole idea of redemption? Paying the price to gain something back that was lost. In other words, if you've got a big, beautiful diamond ring and uh, you get in financial straits, you can go to the hawk shop and you can get a few bucks for that diamond ring. Put it in hawk. But you cannot get it back until you do what? Redeem it. You pay the price to once again gain control of that which was hawked. Well, you see, that's exactly what happened when Adam sinned. He hawked the human race to Satan. And this is the whole idea of the coming tribulation is when God will finally pay off that debt that Satan is holding over the planet. And he's going to pay it off with all of the wrath and vexation of that. But for mankind, he paid the price of redemption with his death on the cross. Every sin was paid for. It has been made possible for every human being to come out of that slave market. The price of redemption was paid. And we experience it only by virtue of our salvation experience. And again, the other offshoot word of salvation in Scripture is saved. Paul used it over and over, by which you are saved by which you experience salvation. All right, so we have two great words right here in one verse. We are justified freely through the redemption or the process of paying the price which is in Christ Jesus. And then verse 25, which God or whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood. The price of redemption. Now, Peter said, I won't make you go back and look at it, but Peter makes it so plain that you've not been redeemed with silver and gold, but with what? With the precious blood of Christ. That was the price of redemption. 
And to think that most of Christendom has thrown the blood out the back door. They'll never mention it. They don't preach it. Horrors. It is the very basis of our salvation. And we dare not walk it underfoot because it's by virtue of our faith in that shed blood, which is the price of redemption, that he could buy us back from having been hocked to Satan when Adam fell. All right, then you come on down to verse 26. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he, God in Christ, might be just. Now, what does it mean to be just? Fair, with no room for controversy. And so God is just in doing what? Justifying the person who believes. Oh, I love these verses how it just screams against a works religion. We're redeemed by placing our faith in that shed blood of Christ. We are justified when we believe the gospel that Christ died, was buried, and rose again. And God is perfectly just in declaring us as justified. He's sovereign. He can do that. Now that's a a concept that is beyond my understanding. How can he take this sinner, born of Adam, and by my simple faith in what he has done there at Calvary, declare me just as if I have never sinned? That's justification. Now, that doesn't mean I won't sin. Don't ever think that. Ask my wife. <laughs> but, so far as God is concerned, I'm just as if I have never sinned. That's what justification does for us. And we're to live with that concept. Now listen, if you go through life knowing that God has declared you as bought out of the slave market, justified from all things, doesn't that give you incentive to do your part? Not for salvation, but as a result of it. Sure it should. My goodness it should. And it should behoove every believer to do everything we can, as Paul instructs in his epistles, to flee the things of the flesh and to avoid every appearance of evil. Well, now I'm going to take you all the way up to Romans chapter 7. And the whole idea is that as a result of our salvation... God has now redeemed us, justified us. He has given us the indwelling Holy Spirit. He has placed us into the body of Christ. He has declared that we are now children of God. And on and on I could go with all the things that came in the moment we were saved as a result of our salvation. But that's not just for a fire escape. We are to be productive. We are to do all we can to win others. Now, I remember way, way back in some of our early programs, that's probably even before the, the uh, Russian Empire crumbled. And I used an example out of Time magazine. And it was a little box on the bottom of the page. And they had interviewed a young communist worker in Moscow. And I shared it on the program. How that young man said that as soon as he got off work, say at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, he couldn't wait to get down to communist headquarters to work for the party. And he would work for the communist party until 10, 11 o'clock at night for the sole purpose of promoting communism. And I said at the time, would that some believers would have that kind of motivation. But, oh, most Christians are just content to sit and let the rest of the world go by. Listen, we should be motivated to get out there and do something that will bring somebody, see? All right, and the other one is right now today. Who are the militants? The Muslim world. And what do they really want? World dominion. And what are they going to do to get it? They're going to work day and night. And we sit on our duff and do nothing. But that's not what God intended. 
God intends us to be productive. All right, Romans 7, verse 4. Romans 7, verse 4. Wherefore, my brethren, Paul writes, you also are become dead to the law. We're not under law. See, that's the same thing he's trying to tell these Hebrews. Get away from the legalism. Get out from under Judaism and step out into this, which is so much better. And so he says, Wherefore, my brethren, you also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. In other words, by virtue of his crucifixion. And that you should be married to another. Now, this, of course, is just a scriptural, uh, what shall I say, use of words to prove a point that we are now united with Christ, just like a man married to a mother. For what purpose? That we should bring forth fruit. What does that mean? You should have an impact on people around you to the place that you can bring in some lost souls. Now, I can just probably make a blanket statement without having anyone in mind. Most believers go all the way to their grave never having led one person to Christ. Think about it. Never. Even their own children even their own children, they have never brought them to a knowledge of salvation. And if every believer, if every believer would just win one, my, what a difference we could make. But we don't do it. I can remember in some of my younger days hearing people say, well, that's the preacher's job. That's the Sunday school teacher's job. Well, yes, but it's yours. It's mine. And I always say that doesn't mean you collar people and force these things down their throat. It simply means that you're skilled enough in the scriptures that when someone asks a question, take them to the book. Take them to the book. If nothing else, have a few notes in the back of your Bible that will help you to show them some scriptures, how that it is by faith in that work of the cross, plus nothing. Oh, I know people hate that. I had a gentleman call again the other day, and he says, Les, why do people think they have to do something? Well, that's that old Adamic nature, see? And to overcome that takes a lot of patience. I had a gentleman call just yesterday, and uh, he said, you know, he said, I can understand it. He said, since I've been saved through our program, he says, I've uh, gone back to the church where I was raised, and he said, I present these things. And he said, I have asked some of my fellow church people, do you know what the gospel is? And he says, you know what? They look at me, they don't have a clue. They don't know what the gospel is. I had another one write a couple years ago, and he had done the same thing. And he says, you know what most people in my church answered when I asked them, what's the gospel? The Bible? Well, he says, the Bible's got the gospel, but that's not the gospel. But see, this is where Christendom is tonight. They are so pitifully ignorant that most church people cannot tell you what is the gospel. How do you gain salvation? They don't have a clue. Well, that's where you come in. That's where I come in. We've got to let them know that it's not a whole bunch of do's and don'ts. It's not a whole idea of getting so holy that you're just sort of an oddball. No way. The Christian life, as I've said over and over on this program, is the most practical thing on earth. There is nothing more practical than a solid Christian life. You'll never find a good, true, believing Christian caught up in the throes of, of court proceedings and uh, crime. That's not their lifestyle. Now, we can all fail. My, we can all make a mistake. Don't ever get me wrong. But it is not the Christian's lifestyle to be constantly on the police blotter. 
And so this is what the scripture tells us. See that now we're to consider ourselves just like a, a woman that is married to her husband. We are in union with Christ and the purpose is that we are to produce fruit. We're to get busy. And we better. Or the Muslim world will overtake us. And then we'll wish we would have. But it's going to be too late. See. All right. Let's move on to yet another one. Uh, Ephesians. The time is going fast. Let's go to Ephesians. Chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Oh my goodness. I could start way up verse 1, but let's just jump down to verse 4. Ephesians 2, verse 4. Now remember, this is all jumping off from that word salvation in Hebrews chapter 6. That Paul was agreeing that the believing element of these Hebrews had. They had salvation. So he wasn't condemning them for being apostate. But it was the people who were a part and parcel of their congregation who were and had been. But all right, now in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4, But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sin, the offspring of Adam, he hath quickened or made us alive spiritually together with Christ, for by grace are you saved. And he hath raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. And he always has a purpose in everything he does. And here is another one, that in the ages to come, eternity, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Now here comes that classic verse. Every believer should know this from memory. For by grace are you saved. Unmerited favor. We don't deserve it. It's by grace you are saved through faith. And that not of yourself. Is there anything added there? Uh-uh. There's nothing in there of baptism. There's nothing in there of tongues. There's nothing in there of good works. We're saved by faith plus nothing. Now I always have to qualify that. That doesn't mean that we can just say, oh, I'm saved, and then go on our way. And that's not why I'm teaching. We're saved for the purpose of producing fruit. And that is not easy believism. It's not easy to get out there and produce fruit. My, you've heard me use it over and over, and I'll use it again. If you're paddling a canoe up a river, upstream, how much of the time can you take the paddle out of the water? Never. Never. Because the moment you do, back down the river you go. And it's a constant exercise of energy to keep moving on in the Christian experience. So don't ever let anyone accuse me of an easy believism. All I say, it is so simple because God has done all that needs to be done. And all we have to do is believe it, but recognize that God's going to move in and make us a new creation so that we can bear fruit. All right, let's read on in Ephesians. For by grace are you saved, verse 8, through faith, that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. And you don't work for a gift. Not of works. Because if it was works, then people could boast. And then verse 10. See, here's where we follow our salvation, for we are His workmanship. We are something now that God is working to form us and to prepare us for our service. And we're created in Christ Jesus unto good works. See? Not for salvation, I think that's evident, but as a result of it, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in in them. All right, now I'm going to take verses 11, 12, and 13 because, again, too many people don't know these are in their Bible. And look what it says. Wherefore, remember. And remember, he's writing to Gentiles. He's writing to you and I. 
Remember that you being in times past were Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision, which remember was a derogatory term that the Jews used concerning Gentile. And usually they made it even a little more derogatory by adding the word dogs. Gentiles were uncircumcised dogs in the Jewish vernacular. And so Paul is alluding to that same thing, that that's what the circumcision in the flesh called Gentile. But now verse 12, that at that time, while God was dealing with Israel back there in that Old Testament economy and during Christ's earthly ministry, and yes, even these Hebrews to whom Paul is addressing the letter, that at that time you Gentiles were without Christ, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. We weren't citizens of Israel. We're not Jews. We were uncircumcised Gentiles. All right, and so we were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. We were strangers from the covenants of promise. Consequently, where were the Gentiles before the age of grace? Without God, without hope, see? But, verse 13, but the flip side, we're no longer in that time. We are now in this age of grace, but now, in Christ, you who were at one time far off, we Gentiles, are now made nigh, not through the Mosaic law, not through Judaism, not through legalism, but through what? The blood of Christ. Through the blood of Christ. And remember what Romans said concerning the blood of Christ? Put your faith in it. Believe it. God has said that the blood of Christ has paid your sin debt. All right, and uh, I guess our time is just about gone. And uh, again, let's just drop back at Hebrews, Hebrews for just a second. So we got a good jumping off place in our next program. All right, so he says, verse 9 again, Beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though thus we speak, we speak for God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love which you have showed toward his name in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. So these people Paul is commending because they were true believers. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner supported ministry if this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felder.